so honored to have this next duo coming up on stage. Um, Nancy Vonk and Janet Keston have worked together as a creative team for, I think they said, 20 years. Oh my God, that's awesome. I'm about to have my 20th wedding anniversary, so I know exactly what that's like. Um, and they're most revered for the work they did as co-chief um, creative officers at Ogilvy Toronto on the Dove Real Beauty campaign, which has really shaken up. Yes. Um, but one of the things they realized was that a lot of the reasons they succeeded was because they didn't um, play by the age-old rules, which is a big theme here today. And they have a book coming out this um, spring or summer from HarperCollins that we will tweet the hell out of once it comes out so you guys know about it. Um, but it's basically about the sink or swim moments um, in business. And their agency now, which they run, which is a leadership company is called SWIM. So today they're going to share with us two to three of the principles from this upcoming book and how we can put them to use in agency life. So it's my huge honor to welcome to the stage Nancy and Janet. I'm loving that I, that photograph's like 15 years old. <laughs> so I'm already in a great mood if you just squint your eyes a little bit. Same difference. So to spell it out, I'm Nancy. I'm Janet. <laughs> and we're not normal. <laughs> Certainly not as top 3% success stories go. Janet and I were an advertising art director writer team who never wanted to be creative directors. We didn't have a shred of ambition for that position. <laughs> we're mothers who never wanted to be bosses of any kind. Except of our kids. All right. <laughs> True. Much of our success hasn't come in spite of motherhood, but because of it. And we had to be shoved up through the glass ceiling, mostly by men. One of these men, even while doing the shoving, doing his best to sell me on taking the top job that he was leaving to go to greener pastures in New York, which is an oxymoron. They weren't really greener. Um, presented me with a rather large catch, even as he, he really wanted me to take the job. So that was, as far as he was concerned, when it comes to women leading creative departments, children were out. So picture John Cleese's younger, better looking brother taking a big drag on a cigarette and looking me in the eye and saying, darling, you can't do both. Darling, darling, you can't do both. <laughs> uh, that seemed like that was a pretty good book title, uh, which is what our editor at HarperCollins thought after hearing us speak about our, our career path at an event in Toronto called Women of Influence, which is one of those, you know, tell your life story things and hope people think that's awesome. <laughs> and, um, and she came up to us afterwards and she said, you guys have broken every rule of business success, and that's a book. And we're like, really? Are you kidding me? It took a fair amount of convincing on her part, and our starting point was kind of like, no way. But five years later, the book is almost coming to a shelf or e-shelf near you. And today is actually not so much of a, of a book reading, given that you know there's no book and everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> But instead, it's what we call a people magazine on the toilet-sized bits uh, about business rules, especially the unspoken ones that women need to break to find greater career success, however you choose to define that. So we're going to really smoothly, not awkwardly at all, go back and forth <laughs> um, in talking about them. So rule to break, nice girls don't get in your face. So we all know, or I'm going to assume an awful lot of you know, that um, from our earliest days on this planet, that girls are groomed to be pleasers. Um, yes, I'll do it. Sure, I'll do that project that Joe can't do on the weekend, on the holiday weekend. Assertive just isn't the natural starting point for most of us. And we come by that honestly. But achieving ambitious goals calls for stepping into assertiveness. 
wherever you are on the shy to bossy continuum. I'm plenty bossy. I was born with a bullhorn in my hand. Look at Janet nodding. <laughs> but even a bossy pants like me can struggle with behaving assertively when you really need to. For me, for every other woman with a pulse, aversion to conflict is often what's at play when we say yes, when we know we really should have said no. I'd love to think I'm really great with conflict, and often I am, but the fact is I've often gone for the short-term win. That short-term win, you, when you say yes and you get happy faces and relief and gratitude, um, but that is actually sabotaging the long-term goal in the process. I've done a disservice to myself and to my team more than once when, frankly, I just couldn't deal. When it was easier to be the nice girl, easier to see the relief in the room. And I'm going to give you a horribly damning example of this uh, that leaps to mind when I think of the times that's happened. Um, I was in a position to either green light or not green light a critical hire at our agency at one point um, to lead a department. That was the opening was to lead a department. And so there was a small group of us that would have that power. And I, the, the lead candidate was a long time looking for that per, right person. The lead candidate was, was great in so many ways. But I, had kind of, I still had kind of mixed feelings. I'd had some, mm, I don't know about that moment. Great portfolio, except for some shit in it. <laughs> like, where's the part where you show the judgment as a leader on, on that? We've all done shit. Like, we all know that. But editing. Senior level, good. <laughs> the phone call to the references. Hey, so what do you think of so-and-so? Giant pause before saying something. Oh, yeah, great guy. Interesting choice. <laughs> but me, I'm like, you know, try not to hear all that because, God, we're getting desperate. And ultimately, senior client at one of our largest um, accounts gave an ultimatum suddenly one day to the account um, uh, management head. If you do not fill that spot like within the next, I don't know, we might have said week, we are not giving you this giant project. So I'm sitting face to face now with this person who is uh, sweating profusely, pleading. Nancy, can you please say yes, for God's sake? Everybody else has said yes. I'm like, ah. And anyway, we all know what happened in this story. There's no um, surprise ending to it. I said yes. Oh, that worked out well. <laughs> so yes, we kept the project. And then we had the wrong leader for that group for the next like two or three years and saw great people leave, all kinds of bad things that happened with the wrong leadership. So I'd say that that was a worse problem than had we lost the project, frankly. Saying no is such a big challenge, certainly in every group that we've worked with at SWIM, at our leadership training program, um, across many industries, levels of experience, right up to sea level, that we have devised um, unscientifically, a handy guide that we coach people to use uh, when that big moment of decision is in front of you, whether or not to say no or yes. So you might want to take notes. <laughs> it's really good. Um, the next time you're in this position, ask yourself three questions. Does my yes align with the long-term goal? Or is it like I was in, that short term, pressure's on to do the wrong thing, solves the problem in the moment, but you've just completely blown up the longer term goals? Does my yes align with my personal values? It really matters what you think. So who cares what everybody else thinks? What you think matters more than any of that. Does it align with that? Does my yes align with the data available to me? In my example, I had data that yes did not align with. 
giant paws. Yeah, yeah, I guess he's good. That was not, that data said you don't say yes. And finally, for full conviction, when you have to give that unwelcome no, you could ask yourself two more questions. What's the worst that can happen if I say no? In my case, lose the project, oh my god. That might hurt, that might hurt a lot. But what's also, second question, what's the worst that can happen if I say yes? Lose the project, put the wrong leader in place, mayhem ensues. You might um, find that these questions make your choice much, much clearer, and you're going to feel that much more grounded in, in doing the hard thing. And I really invite you to find someone who's well outside the issue to come ask you those questions and to engage in, sol in getting to the right answer with you. Um, in other words, play devil's advocate, which can be incredibly helpful. And that same person might also be helpful in a really critical choice, which is to identify plan B. Because you get out of jail free when you show up not just announcing there's a problem, but when you show up either offering the solution or commit to being part of the solution. You're really unlikely to find that the worst that can happen for you for making that tough call. Um, we have seen people walking around worried they're going to be fired over things that are way less dramatic than my fail. <laughs> um, more likely, you'll experience the best that can happen, which is for the no, you're showing that you have a stake in the ground, you have a point of view, you have conviction, you're strong, and you're behaving like a leader. And that's the kind of nice zone you want to be in. I feel like um, sitting over there, I, I, like I had my legs crossed and my glasses, and I'm like, oh, Jesus, I'm doing the sexy librarian from the 40s movies <laughs> thing. <laughs> oh, God! I'm the antith antithetical to everything we want to say to you today. So I apologize for being a jerk. Um, so rule to break. Next rule to break. Good girls finish last. I want to start with a quick poll. Who has a mentoring program in the shop where they work? Some of you. Some of you not oodles and oodles of you. I'm keeping an eye on the ones who do. Um, who thinks that mentoring is something that nice people do for other people? No, no, it's not. Nice people don't do that. Uh, what do nice people do? Um, who thinks it's a career building strategy for people who are on their way to the top? Look at you guys. You are unbelievably ahead of the curve, my friends. Because for Nancy and me, mentoring turned into a complete act of enlightened self-interest. We've secretly coined, TM'd the phrase, uh, selfish mentoring, which sounds like an oxymoron, I know, but it's actually a, an authentic career strategy. And I discovered this entirely, entirely by accident quite a long time ago where the um, same boss who said, darling, you can't do both, um, <laughs> told me that he was going to fire a certain young copywriter, and that young copywriter wasn't me. Um, this young guy had been working in our, our accounting department and he wanted to be a writer so badly. And he did everything you can imagine, you know, everything humanly possible to get this job, including leaping into the creative director's cab when he saw it um, at, a, at a street, stopped at a, at a red light, and begging him for an interview, and then leaping out again into moving traffic. <laughs> The, I think he was just so like, oh, I can't believe this opportunity, that frankly he nearly died as a result of trying to get the job. So knowing that the guy had laid his, you know, put his life on the line for this job, literally, when um, Mark, our boss, wanted to sack him because he couldn't write, um, did I mention the part about wanted to be a copywriter, couldn't write. No, probably not. Um, he, he was one of those guys who had great headlines and good ideas, but he couldn't write a sentence or a paragraph, a bit of a lack. 
But even so, I just felt like I couldn't let it happen. And when, when Mark told me he was going to let him go, I found myself saying, I can save him. <laughs> and um, Mark said to me, and kind of nodded, and then he said um, that I had six months, and if the guy still didn't cut it, then he would be fired, and so would I. I want to tell you that I am not all that self-sacrificing, and if I would have had any idea that that would have been said to me, I don't think I would have been quite so quick to, to offer my help, but there I was stuck and to save my own neck I had to figure out how to raise up this guy in a hurry and I'll say that the outcome of that story is he actually became a creative director in his own right and, and he was truly very talented and, and he did really well but the next thing we knew Nancy and I were running the Ogilvy internship program and writing an online advice column for young ad people, and we wrote an ad week book to help young people break into advertising. So we put a freakish amount of time and energy into growing talent, and that led straight to us being named co-chief creative officers of our, of our company. We never had very much money um, at Ogilvy Toronto. I'm sure some of you in smaller shops can relate. We were a smallish office in a smallish market Canada, big country, no people. <laughs> we just, so we just treated our interns like we treated everybody else. We paid them and we expected them to deliver. Not just to make decks or make other people's work look pretty. Their ideas counted for just as much as everybody else's and they had all the same opportunities. People turned down real jobs to be part of our internship program. Some of our summer interns won Can Lions, and Grand Clio's. Their names were attached to big brands like Dove and Maxwell House and Jaguar and Shreddies. Um, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with the Diamond Shreddies campaign. I see nodding, that's good. Nodding and laughing. The intern who did <laughs> Diamond Shreddies actually wound up on the cover of Maclean's, which is Canada's Time magazine equivalent. I admit it was a slow news week. Um, <laughs> the headline was the intern who saved Shreddies and he got three pages. Um, we don't, you know, not a lot happens in Canada. <laughs> we, <laughs> we're peaceful and quiet. We, we started, Nancy and I started mentoring early in our, in our careers because we felt like it. We didn't know how to do it. There was no guide. There were no schools. You're your own school when you decide to do something like that. But here's some of what we learned from working with them that changed our careers and might have a bit of an impact on yours. My way is one way, not the only way. I think um, it, it, creative directors, you know, we're control freaks. We want things a certain way. We, we keep our hands pretty tightly on the wheel. And um, we were guilty a lot of being too closed. And we really had to learn to, you know, let go. We had to learn to let go so that they could learn. People can't learn if they can't make their own mistakes. So our job in that case was just to lead them back out of the doo-doo if they stepped in it and help them understand how they got there so they wouldn't make that mistake a second time. It wasn't always to be perfect, right? You're, as, a, as a boss, your job isn't always to get the best thing only or isn't only to get the best thing out the door. You're always going for that. But your job is to teach people and raise people. Um, we also learned to negotiate world peace when, uh, when juniors had better ideas than the seniors. We had to say to our senior people, sorry guys, put down your tools and help bring someone else's idea to life. This is not an easy tightrope to walk and people get kind of mad at you for a while, but um, those people also become better future leaders because they start to learn some stuff. Start thinking early about we instead of me. I, we work in a business where we really focus on, on the me because that's how we're rewarded. But leadership is about, is about we. People say, why invest? They'll just leave. In fact, people stayed with us so long that sometimes we actually had to kick them out. Um, so we're, we're all in a business that kicks people upstairs because they're good at their craft, not because they know how to lead others. 
And building a career on the backs of juniors may seem kind of self-serving. I admit it could be. But it isn't if it's actually what you're interested in. Right? It's, not, it's not the right path for everybody. Not everybody should feel like they ought to do it or have to do it. There's no arm twisting here. But you learn amazing leadership skills when you decide you're going to develop other people. And it's what set us apart from other people when agencies were looking for people to fill the top leadership jobs. Um, and it's not just us. I, I coach a woman right now in a large agency where it's pretty hard to get seen. It's pretty hard to be differentiated from the pack. And she mentioned to me recently that her whole team is, is millennials, probably like any number of all y'all in the room, um, and how much she loves them and how much she gets out of them. And there's none of this, they're lazy, they're demanding <laughs> stuff at all. And we never found that. That was the age group that we <laughs> loved the most. And, um, and the, her agency is recognizing that, and it set her on a different path in their eyes. So um, it's easy to look as, at mentoring as a brownie badge. Tying shoes, check. Pitching a tent, check. Mentoring, check. It's actually a secret weapon. There's a book called Why Good Girls Don't Get Ahead. If good means docile and agreeable and demure, I can see why they don't. But if it means do the right thing in the right way, and you'll be amazed how it pays you back, I say be as good as you want to be. We did have a millennial slacker. <laughs> we probably, I was saying to we her, had a few. I was saying, remember Kara? <laughs> you said a name. <laughs> like they know, oh, like they God. know. Anybody you know named Kara, it's not her. <laughs> Rule to break, get out the golf clubs. <laughs> networking, ooh. Here we are at a big old networking event, yes. <laughs> it's excellent, show of hands now and be honest. Who here puts a lot of energy and strategy into networking? It's in your calendar with the same immovable and important uh, qualities as like a major client presentation. I see one person raising their hand. <laughs> Good, I'm so glad it didn't go the other way. This wouldn't have gone very well. And I would have said not that long ago, yeah, who has time for it, right? I have about 50 better things to do, like finish up that article, do the grocery shopping, wash my hair. It didn't take much for me to talk myself out of going to these kinds of events and being in those situations. For me, for much of my ad career, I saw networking as an antiquated practice that happened on golf courses with mostly men and a few women that acted like men. Time schmoozing, time poorly spent. I had real work to do, thank you very much. And if getting to high places meant I had to do that kind of networking thing, then I thought maybe high places are not for me. I counted on my hard work speaking for itself Dumbass men's golf games and drinks at the club, be damned. For a very long time, I was nowhere near thinking of networking as critical to career development. The funny thing was, though, that even I was think as I was thinking these things, I was networking and I didn't know it. I was very, very fortunate to be invited to start judging at awards shows. Um, I didn't think of, and I didn't think of what was happening there as networking. I just thought of it as getting to know people, really connected people. Um, from the Richmond show, which was kind of my first real one, to, uh, to shows like Cannes, I was meeting people of influence who helped me in so many ways. My excellent new friends meant things like introductions to a connection that would help me get a project done. Um, Watch outs on a new client. Oh my God, I've worked with him. Be careful, <laughs> he does this. Um, or, you know, I was one quick email away from being saved from making a big mistake. So those shows were as surely as a hotbed of networking as the 18th hole ever was. They kicked off a new way of seeing interaction with my peers and people far above me. So I got new perspective on 
how really critically important it was um, to meet people in positions of influence with lessons and help to share. And so the shows were part of the launch of, of this new way of thinking and, and, and a more enjoyable journey for that matter, going through this business with more friends around me. Um, I'm, by the way, not suggesting here that here's my advice, be on a jury. I do recommend that if you have any opportunity to do it, absolutely accept it and think of it as not just a really fun boondoggle, but something that's really, really good for your career development. And I happen to think myself that the ADC and uh, with friends like Cindy Gallup championing the 50-50 initiative is a really, really great idea that's going to mean many more women can have that career making opportunity and inject really critically badly needed female perspective into that ju judging experience. I have judged every show on earth. I've been the token female on every show on earth. <laughs> Ask me what happened. Um, the things I can't say when I'm mic'd. <laughs> I took the practices of um, those interactions on those juries into my everyday career experience. And now I was contacting creative directors I used to think of as adversaries um, out of, wow, you know what, I bet that would be really interesting. And sharing wisdom, asking them for theirs, asking for advice. The people that I thought of as armor up let their armor down. It was really fun. I have many good relationships that are born of networking that only happen in email that are just very brief exchanges. My preconceived notions about networking being too time consuming were just plain wrong. So if I was networking kind of happily by accident and organically doing the right thing, what I want to suggest to you guys is that you actually do it with purpose and with regularity. You just have too much to gain to leave it to happenstance like I did. Um, or certainly to blow it off as a sort of frill versus thinking of it as critical to your advancement. When you do put yourself out there like all of you are doing at this conference, I'm going to give you the secret to success when you want to impress Susan Creedle or any of the other fabulous people who are here. This is just one tip in our book, OK? It's a really good one. And here it is. You're going to win with that new stranger, your new friend, when you shut up. Shut up, shut up. Listen well and win them over. Shutting up is not my forte. And it was a very good day when I met a woman named Claire Hasid. She used to be the head of planning at um, Saatchi in New York. And she put it this way, listening is a gift you give the speaker. And it's the difference between starting an authentic relationship and being quickly forgotten. She is literally, this was just two years ago, she's the first person who put listening skills on my radar. It's like in that conversation, I'm like, listening skills, what's that? <laughs> and Janet was just as bad, although she's naturally a much better listener than I am. So another poll, another little poll. Who here is a, you consider yourself to be a good listener? Not a trick question. So most of you. All right, so one, the, my next question is, who of you here have ever been in a conversation, and maybe bear in mind a client specifically, where while they're talking, you're formulating your response? <laughs> if it's not 100%, the rest of you are lying. Or thinking about you know the argument you just had with your boyfriend or dinner or something like that. So we all do that, right? I mean, 100%. <laughs> me, me, me. That's exactly to this moment, even as I tell you about being a good listener, it's my struggle. Um, Claire pointed out that your brain cannot actually be hearing fully what's being said to you and do other things at once. It's just not possible. And maybe one of the worst things about that is that you miss information. You literally miss information. And don't kid yourself, 
it often shows right on your face. You're just not that slick. Nobody is. One of the top barriers to strong connections with others is the lousy feeling of not being heard. It's true for coworkers and employees and spouses and kids and your boss. And certainly anyone you're hoping to begin a relationship with right here at the 3% conference in a networking opportunity. So here's a thought. Create thoughtful pauses rather than jumping on people's words. I'm really good at jumping on people's words. I can't wait to say what I think about the half a sentence they said. <laughs> Be conscious of body language. Amazingly enough, probably 50% of good listening is grounded in visual data. There's what they said, and then there's what they mean. And often, body language is telling you the more full, full meaning. So in other words, channel your inner Bill Clinton or Oprah, if you will, the world champions of listening. They know that listening, good listening is power. It draws people to you because we like people who make us feel heard. You know it. You can picture either of them talking, this, the cliche image of them you know, zoned in. <coughs> they make that one person in the room, even in a room of thousands, feel like they're the only person talking. Here's the problem, though. Good listening is freaking hard. It is really, really, really hard. And I'm going to invite you to try it mindfully when you leave this room, maybe with the buddy sitting next to you. Just let them talk for like three minutes without you saying anything. <laughs> Good luck with that. <coughs> and be conscious of the many, many, many thoughts coming into your mind while they're talking. Suddenly you'll realize, holy shit, I'm, so, I'm thinking about 20 other things. Be conscious of your own impulse to interrupt, to contribute to what they're saying. Not that that's a terrible thing, but if you, when you jump in, they're going to change the course of what they were saying. You'll never know what they might have said, which might have been better. So be aware of your automatic inclination to form that snappy response. Put that laser focus on the speaker, give them that gift, it really pays off in spades. You will see that, especially when you apply it to your client relationships, as a game changer. And I know it sounds small. Maybe it kind of looks small. But it is, I promise you, it's huge. And it's strengthened with lots and lots of practice. So I invite you to stand out today as you meet new people for not only what you said, but for what you didn't say. Hello again. Uh, rule to break. Gender is not an issue. <laughs> I'm going to um, end our contribution to today um, with what's actually the first chapter of, of our book, um, which is that gender is not an issue and we all need to kind of get over it and move on. It's interesting to be at an event about the, you know, the circumstances that we all find ourselves in in our business at this moment in time with so very few women in, in top jobs. Um, this is really an event that is about the female brain drain. It's about trying to get more women into positions of, of influence. It's about trying to stop the mass exodus of women from our business, which is real. Lots and lots and lots of women come in. Lots of women come in. The schools are graduating, you know, boys and girls at, at exactly the same rate and lots of young women get hired into the business and then 10 years later it's like a magic trick. Boom, where did they all go? And it's not, um, I don't think it's just because, oh, they had kids and they decided to stay home. I don't think that's what it is. Um, 
so I'm not going to tell you a story. Uh, I'm just going to make a few observations. Um, and part of it is based even on conversations that we've heard since we arrived this morning, you know, in hallways and, and, and things like that. Um, if women haven't had the experience personally of, of coming up against a barrier that actually did have a, some kind of a gender sort of lens put onto it, uh, it's, it's hard to, to see it as real. I think that if we haven't, I mean, it's like anything in life, you know, it's like having a baby or being a creative director or whatever, and until it happens to you, you don't kind of get it on a visceral level. And um, Nancy was one of those lucky people who, until well into her career, really truly just never came up against it ever. And, um, and her view of it was, if I can do it, anybody can. If you've got a problem, it's not because of your gender. Uh, I'll, if there's, you know, there's the kind of, I'll earn my own way on my own merit. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and, you know, for me, um, early on in my career, a creative director, I wanted to work on beer. Who would want to work on beer now? But I wanted to work on beer. It was like the total marquee account of the time. And, and I was a kid, and, and I wanted to work on the fancy, you know, high-profile stuff, just like everybody else did. And I was told, you can no more understand beer than I can understand tampons. <gasps> Gasp! <laughs> Who would say that? In Canada, you would be arrested for saying that. Like, like you're literally not allowed to say something like that. But I mean, it's so shocking. And I mean, it's not a thousand years ago that this, that this happened. Um, a number of years later, so to me, like it was, it was pretty obvious from the beginning that, that you know, girls were allowed to do this and boys could do anything. And, and that surprised me because I wasn't raised with that, with that view. I didn't come from a family that subscribed to that. I came from a family of mostly like of all girls. So girls could do anything, and then I came into business, and all of a sudden it's like, Arr! so um, a number of years later, I was researching an article just to kind of see what had changed in, in our business, and I wound up calling all kinds of, of creative directors around, um, you know, and they were all, at that time anyway, all the creative directors were men. And, and so I called around just to get people's points of view on things, and of course I heard the classic, well, I can't find any good women, which, you know, I still hear it now way too often. Um, I was told that, this just kills me actually, that most of the great artists and writers in history had been male. <laughs> and so maybe we had something to learn from that as an industry. I don't know what. Um, we, had, we had a very, very senior female executive in our business. This is not very long ago at all. Uh, admit to us behind closed doors that she had been treated outrageously by her male superiors when she was coming up. But um, in the press, she said that gender doesn't matter. Gender's not an issue. So we don't, you know, it's hard to admit, honestly. Um, we know women who won't hire women because they're of childbearing age or they have kids already. They decide just like some men would that kids mean less commitment on the part of women. It's incredibly ironic that kids mean more commitment on the part of men. Business looks at men with kids and say they're stable and they're solid and they're not gonna run off with some hussy <laughs> and leave us in the lurch. You know, women, it's like, oh my God, they're gonna go to the doctor appointment, they're gonna go to the school meeting, they're not committed, which of course, I, we did not find to be true at all. We, um, we as an industry, I think we still think I won't hire women who have children is a big factor and it's a very real problem and it robs our industry of a lot of the best talent. I'm gonna say for myself, I got better at my job after I had a baby. I used my time differently. I was more effective. 
I was on some level a little more balanced as to brain and heart. Maybe I was a little more brain and a little, like I stopped thinking of my job as my kid, so which made me a little less, you know, attached. And, and that, that, you know, the stepping back, the opportunity to see the big picture a little bit better made me, made me far better. And Nancy would say the same. And we observed it to be true of the women that we hired who then had kids at various points after they came to work for us. They became better time managers, they understood the world in a different and deeper way, and they brought a kind of a humanity to the work that you just don't see all the time. So um, we absolutely believe gender is an issue, but it's not just a women's issue. I'm glad to see that there are men in the audience. I wish there were more. It's a human issue and we need to recognize it in order to move past it. We need things to change, so we don't need conferences like this or books like ours. I'm working hard to put Nancy and me and Kat out of business here. Um, if you think things are changing, you're probably right. If you think they're changing quickly, you're kidding yourself. Women still hold only 4% of the world's top jobs, 3% in advertising. And we account for only 5.2% of the world's top earners. Overall, advertising is um, a highly paid industry. Some of us make pots of money. <laughs> Can't say that I am one of those people. But if anybody wants to give me pots of money, I'm still open for that. Um, some of us make lots of money, but most of us don't earn, even the ones of us who make a lot, don't earn anything close to what our male colleagues do. And all the stats suggest it'll be somewhere between 55 and 98 years before there's wage parity for women broadly, not just in advertising. And personally, I don't think we should have to wait for an entire century to get paid equally. So um, we are thrilled to have been asked to share our thoughts with you today. We're knocked out by what the 3% conference is trying to do. And we hope you will talk to us later because this conversation is not over. <laughs> Thank you.